The International Labour Organization is a United Nations agency dealing with labor issues, particularly international labor standards and decent work for all. 185 of the 193 UN member states are members of the ILO. In 1969, the organization received the Nobel Peace Prize for improving peace among classes, pursuing justice for workers, and providing technical assistance to other developing nations. The ILO registers complaints against entities that are violating international rules. However, it does not impose sanctions on governments. Governance, organization, and membership. Unlike other United Nations specialized agencies, the International Labour Organization has a tripartite governing structure a euro representing governments, employers, and workers. The rationale behind the tripartite structure is the creation of free and open debate among governments and social partners. The ILO Secretariat is referred to as the International Labour Office. Governing Body The governing body decides the agenda of the International Labour Conference, adopts the draft program and budget of the organization for submission to the conference, elects the Director General, requests information from member states concerning labor matters, appoints commissions of inquiry and supervises the work of the International Labor Office. Juan Samavale was the ILO's Director General since 1999 until October 2012, when Guy Ryder was elected as his replacement. This guiding body is composed of 28 government representatives, 14 workers' representatives, and 14 employers' representatives. Ten of the government seats are held by member states that are nations of chief industrial importance, as first considered by an impartial committee. The nations are Brazil, China, France, Germany, India, Italy, Japan, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom and the United States. The terms of office are three years. International Labour Conference the ILO organizes the International Labor Conference in Geneva every year in June, where conventions and recommendations are crafted and adopted. Also known as the Parliament of Labor, the conference also makes decisions about the ILO's general policy, work program and budget. Each member state has four representatives at the conference, two government delegates, an employer delegate and a worker delegate. All of them have individual voting rights, and all votes are equal regardless of the population of the delegate's member state. The employer and worker delegates are normally chosen in agreement with the most representative national organizations of employers and workers. Usually, the workers' delegates coordinate their voting, as do the employers' delegates all delegates have the same rights, and are not required to vote in blocks. Conventions Through July 2011, the ILO has adopted 189 conventions. If these conventions are ratified by enough governments, they become in force. However, ILO conventions are considered international labor standards regardless of ratifications. When a convention comes into force, it creates a legal obligation for ratifying nations to apply its provisions. Every year the International Labor Conference's Committee on the Application of Standards examines a number of alleged breaches of international labor standards. Governments are required to submit reports detailing their compliance with the obligations of the conventions they have ratified. Conventions that have not been ratified by member states have the same legal forces do recommendations. In 1998, the 86th International Labour Conference adopted the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. This declaration contains four fundamental policies, the right of workers to associate freely and bargain collectively the end of forced and compulsory labor, the end of child labor, and the end of unfair discrimination among workers. The ILO asserts that its members have an obligation to work towards fully respecting these principles, embodied in relevant ILO conventions. The ILO conventions which embody the fundamental principles have now been ratified by most member states. Recommendations Recommendations do not have the binding force of conventions and are not subject to ratification. Recommendations may be adopted at the same time as conventions to supplement the latter with additional or more detailed provisions. In other cases recommendations may be adopted separately and may address issues separate from particular conventions. Membership As of 2013, 
185 of the 193 member states of the United Nations are members of the ILO. The Union member states which are not members of the ILO are Andorra, Bhutan, Liechtenstein, Micronesia, Monaco, Nauru, North Korea and Tonga. The ILO constitution permits any member of the UN to become a member of the ILO. To gain membership, a nation must inform the Director General that it accepts all the obligations of the ILO constitution. Members of the ILO under the League of Nations automatically became members when the organization's new constitution came into effect after World War II. In addition, any original member of the United Nations and any state admitted to the UN thereafter may join. Other states can be admitted by a two-thirds vote of all delegates, including a two-thirds vote of government delegates, at any ILO general conference. Position within the UN, the International Labour Organization is a specialized agency of the United Nations. As with other UN specialized agencies working on international development, the ILO is also a member of the United Nations Development Group. History, Origins while the ILO was established as an agency of the League of Nations following World War I, its founders had made great strides in social thought and action before 1919. The core members all knew one another from earlier private professional and ideological networks, in which they exchanged knowledge, experiences, and ideas on social policy. Pre-war epistemic communities, such as the International Association for Labour Legislation, founded in 1900 and political networks, such as the Socialist Second International, were a decisive factor in the institutionalization of international labor politics. In the post-Euro World War I euphoria, the idea of a makeable society was an important catalyst behind the social engineering of the ILO architects. As a new discipline, international labor law became a useful instrument for putting social reforms into practice. The utopian ideals of the founding members a Euro social justice and the right to decent work a Euro were changed by diplomatic and political compromises made at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, showing the ILO's balance between idealism and pragmatism. Over the course of the First World War, the international labor movement proposed a comprehensive program of protection for the working classes, conceived as compensation for labor support during the war. Post-war reconstruction and the protection of labor unions occupied the attention of many nations during and immediately after World War I. In Great Britain, the Whitley Commission, a subcommittee of the Reconstruction Commission, recommended in its July 1918 final report that industrial councils be established throughout the world. The British Labour Party had issued its own reconstruction program in the document titled Labour and the New Social Order. In February 1918, the Third Inter-Allied Labour and Socialist Conference issued its report, advocating an international labour rights body, an end to secret diplomacy, and other goals. And in December 1918, the American Federation of Labour issued its own distinctively apolitical report, which called for the achievement of numerous incremental improvements via the collective bargaining process. IFTU Bern Conference as the war drew to a close, two competing visions for the post-war world emerged. The first was offered by the International Federation of Trade Unions, which called for a meeting in Bern, Switzerland, in July 1919. The Bern meeting would consider both the future of the IFTU and the various proposals which had been made in the previous few years. The IFTU also proposed including delegates from the Central Powers as equals. Samuel Gompers, President of the AFL, boycotted the meeting, wanting the Central Powers delegates in a subservient role as an admission of guilt for their country's role in the bringing about war. Instead, Gompers favored a meeting in Paris which would only consider President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points as a platform. Despite the American boycott, the Bern meeting went ahead as scheduled. In its final report, the Bern Conference demanded an end to wage labor and the establishment of socialism. If these ends could not be immediately achieved, then an international body attached to the League of Nations should enact and enforce legislation to protect workers and trade unions. Commission on International Labour Legislation Meanwhile, the Paris Peace Conference sought to dampen public support for communism. Subsequently, 
the Allied powers agreed that clauses should be inserted into the emerging peace treaty protecting labor unions and workers' rights, and that an international labor body be established to help guide international labor relations in the future. The Advisory Commission on International Labor Legislation was established by the Peace Conference to draft these proposals. The Commission met for the first time on February 1, 1919, and Gompers was elected chairman. Two competing proposals for an international body emerged during the Commission's meetings. The British proposed establishing an international parliament to enact labor laws which each member of the League would be required to implement. Each nation would have two delegates to the parliament, one each from labor and management. An international labor office would collect statistics on labor issues and enforce the new international laws. Philosophically opposed to the concept of an international parliament and convinced that international standards would lower the few protections achieved in the United States, Gompers proposed that the international labor body be authorized only to make recommendations, and that enforcement be left up to the League of Nations. Despite vigorous opposition from the British, the American proposal was adopted. Gompers also set the agenda for the draft charter protecting workers' rights. The Americans made ten proposals. Three were adopted without change, that labor should not be treated as a commodity. That all workers had the right to a wage sufficient to live on. And that women should receive equal pay for equal work. A proposal protecting the freedom of speech, press, assembly, and association was amended to include only freedom of association. A proposed ban on the international shipment of goods made by children under the age of 16 was amended to ban goods made by children under the age of 14. A proposal to require an 8-hour workday was amended to require the 8-hour workday or the 40-hour work week. Four other American proposals were rejected. Meanwhile, international delegates proposed three additional clauses, which were adopted, one or more days for weekly rest the quality of laws for foreign workers, and regular and frequent inspection of factory conditions. The Commission issued its final report on March 4, 1919, and the Peace Conference adopted it without amendment on April 11. The report became Part 13 of the Treaty of Versailles. Interwar Period The first annual conference began on October 29, 1919 at the Pan American Union in Washington, D.C. and adopted the first six international labor conventions, which dealt with hours of work in industry, unemployment, maternity protection, night work for women, minimum age, night work for young persons in industry. The prominent French socialist Albert Thomas became its first director general. Despite open disappointment and sharp critique, the revived International Federation of Trade Unions quickly adapted itself to this mechanism. The IFTU increasingly oriented its international activities around the lobby work of the ILO. At the time of establishment, the U.S. government was not a member of ILO, as the U.S. Senate rejected the Covenant of the League of Nations, and the United States could not join any of its agencies. Following the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt to the U.S. presidency, the new administration made renewed efforts to join the ILO even without League membership. On June 19, 1934, the U.S. Congress passed a joint resolution authorizing the president to join ILO without joining the League of Nations as a whole. On June 22, 1934, the ILO adopted a resolution inviting the U.S. government to join the organization. On August 20, 1934, the U.S. government responded positively and took its seat to the ILO. Wartime and the United Nations, during the Second World War, when Switzerland was surrounded by German troops, ILO director John G. Wynant made the decision to leave Geneva. In August 1940, the government of Canada officially invited the ILO to be housed at McGill University in Montreal. Forty staff members were transferred to the temporary offices and continued to work from McGill until 1948. The ILO became the first specialized agency of the United Nations system after the demise of the League in 1946. Its constitution, as amended, includes the Declaration of Philadelphia on the aims and purposes of the organization. Cold War era, in July 1970, 
the United States withdrew 50% of its financial support to the ILO following the appointment of an assistant director general from the Soviet Union. This appointment drew particular criticism from AFL-CIO President George Meany and from Congressman John E. Rooney. However, the funds were eventually paid. On June 12, 1975, the ILO voted to grant the Palestinian Liberation Organization observer status at its meetings. Representatives of the United States and Israel walked out of the meeting. The U.S. House of Representatives subsequently decided to withhold funds. The United States gave notice of full withdrawal on November 6, 1975, stating that the organization had become politicized. The United States also suggested that representation from communist countries was not truly tripartite a euro including government, workers, and employers a euro, because of the structure of these economies. The withdrawal became effective on November 1, 1977. The United States returned to the organization in 1980 after extracting some concessions from the organization. It was partly responsible for the ILO's shift away from a human rights approach and towards support for the Washington Consensus. Economist Guy Standing wrote the ILO quietly ceased to be an international body attempting to redress structural inequality and became one promoting employment equity. Programs, Labor Statistics the ILO is a major provider of labor statistics. Labor statistics are an important tool for its member states to monitor their progress toward improving labor standards. As part of their statistical work, ILO maintains several databases. This database covers 11 major data series for over 200 countries. In addition, ILO publishes a number of compilations of labor statistics, such as the key indicators of labor markets. KILM covers 20 main indicators on labor participation rates, employment, unemployment, educational attainment, labor cost, and economic performance. Many of these indicators have been prepared by other organizations. For example, the Division of International Labor Comparisons of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics prepares the hourly compensation in manufacturing indicator. Training and teaching units the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization is based in Turin, Italy. Together with the University of Turin, Faculty of Law, the ITC offers training for ILO officers and secretariat members, as well as offering educational programs. For instance, the ETLO offers a Master of Laws program in Management of Development, which aims specialized professionals in the field of cooperation and development. Child labor the term child labor is often defined as work that deprives children of their childhood, potential, dignity, and is harmful to their physical and mental development. Child labor refers to work that is mentally, physically, socially or morally dangerous and harmful to children, and interferes with their schooling by depriving them of the opportunity to attend school, obliging them to leave school prematurely, or requiring them to attempt to combine school attendance with excessively long and heavy work. In its most extreme forms, child labor involves children being enslaved, separated from their families, exposed to serious hazards and illnesses and or left to fend for themselves on the streets of large cities a euro often at a very early age. Whether or not particular forms of work can be called child labor depends on the child's age, the type and hours of work performed, the conditions under which it is performed and the objectives pursued by individual countries. The answer varies from country to country, as well as among sectors within countries. Not all work done by children falls under the classification of child labor and therefore should not be so readily targeted for elimination. Children's or adolescents' participation in work that does not negatively affect their health and personal development or interfere with their schooling is generally regarded as being something positive. This includes activities such as helping their parents around the home, assisting in a family business or earning pocket money outside school hours and during school holidays. These kinds of activities contribute to children's development and to the welfare of their families. They provide them with skills and experience, and help to prepare them to be productive members of society during their adult life. ILO's response to child labor. 
the ILO's international program on the elimination of child labor was created in 1992 with the overall goal of the progressive elimination of child labor, which was to be achieved through strengthening the capacity of countries to deal with the problem and promoting a worldwide movement to combat child labor. IPEC currently has operations in 88 countries, with an annual expenditure on technical cooperation projects that reached over 74 million US dollars, a 50 million in 2006. It is the largest program of its kind globally and the biggest single operational program of the ILO. The number and range of IPEC's partners have expanded over the years and now include employers and workers' organizations, other international and government agencies, private businesses, community based organizations, NGOs, the media, parliamentarians, the judiciary, universities, religious groups, and, of course, children and their families. IPEC's work to eliminate child labor is an important facet of the ILO's decent work agenda. Child labor not only prevents children from acquiring the skills and education they need for a better future, it also perpetuates poverty and affects national economies through losses in competitiveness, productivity and potential income. ILO's exceptions in indigenous communities, because of different cultural views involving labor, the International Labor Organization developed a series of culturally sensitive mandates including Conventions No. 169, 107, 138, and 182 to protect indigenous culture, traditions, and identities. Conventions No. 138 and 182 lead in the fight against child labor, while No. 107 and 169 promote the right of indigenous and tribal peoples and protect their right to define their own developmental priorities. The ILO recognizes these changes are necessary to respect the culture and traditions of other communities while also looking after the welfare of children. In many indigenous communities, parents believe children learn important life lessons through the act of work and through the participation in daily life. Working is seen as a learning process preparing children of the future tasks they will eventually have to do as an adult. It is a belief that the family's and child well-being and survival is a shared responsibility between members of the whole family. They also see work as an intrinsic part of their child's developmental process. While these attitudes toward child work remain, many children and parents from indigenous communities still highly value education. ILO wants to include these communities in the fight against exploitative child labor while being sensitive to their traditions and values. Issues Forced labor The ILO has considered the fight against forced labor to be one of its main priorities. During the interwar years, the issue was mainly considered a colonial phenomenon, and the ILO's concern was to establish minimum standards protecting the inhabitants of colonies from the worst abuses committed by economic interests. After 1945, the goal became to set a uniform and universal standard, determined by the higher awareness gained during World War II of politically and economically motivated systems of forced labor, but debates were hampered by the Cold War and by exemptions claimed by colonial powers. Since the 1960s, declarations of labor standards as a component of human rights have been weakened by government of post-colonial countries claiming a need to exercise extraordinary powers over labor in their role as emergency regimes promoting rapid economic development. In June 1998 the International Labor Conference adopted a Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work and its follow-up that obligates member states to respect promote and realize freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, the elimination of all forms of forced or compulsory labor, the effective abolition of child labor, and the elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation. With the adoption of the declaration, the International Labor Organization created the In Focus program on promoting the declaration which is responsible for the reporting processes and technical cooperation activities associated with the declaration. And it carries out awareness raising, advocacy and knowledge functions. In November 2001, following the publication of the In Focus program's first global report on forced labor, the ILO governing body created a special action program to combat forced labor, as part of broader efforts to promote the 1998 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work and its follow-up. 
Since its inception, SAPFL has focused on raising global awareness of forced labor in its different forms, and mobilizing action against its manifestation. Several thematic and country-specific studies and surveys have since been undertaken, on such diverse aspects of forced labor as bonded labor, human trafficking, forced domestic work, rural servitude, and forced prison labor. The Special Action Program to Combat Forced Labor has spearheaded the ILO's work in this field since early 2002. The program is designed to raise global awareness and understanding of modern forced labor, assist governments in developing and implementing new laws, policies and action plans, develop and disseminate guidance and training materials on key aspects of forced labor and trafficking, implement innovative programs that combine policy development, capacity building of law enforcement and labor market institutions, and targeted, field-based projects of direct support for both prevention of forced labor and identification and rehabilitation of its victims. Minimum Wage Law To protect the right of labors for fixing minimum wage, ILO has created Minimum Wage Fixing Machinery Convention, 1928, Minimum Wage Fixing Machinery Convention, 1951 and Minimum Wage Fixing Convention, 1970 is minimum wage law. HIV AIDS, under the name ILO AIDS, the ILO created the Code of Practice on HIV AIDS and the World of Work as a document providing principles for policy development and practical guidelines for programs at enterprise, community, and national levels, including prevention of HIV, management and mitigation of the impact of AIDS on the world of work care and support of workers infected and affected by HIV AIDS, elimination of stigma and discrimination on the basis of real or perceived HIV status. Migrant workers, as the word migrant suggests, migrant workers refer to those who moves from place to place to do their job. For the rights of migrant workers, ILO has adopted conventions, including Migrant Workers Convention, 1975 and United Nations Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families in 1990. Domestic Workers Domestic workers are those who perform a variety of tasks found in other peoples. For example, they may cook slash clean the house and look after children. Yet they are often the ones with the least consideration, excluded from labor and social protection. This is mainly due to the fact that women have traditionally carried out the tasks without pay. For the rights and decent work of domestic workers including migrant domestic workers, ILO has adopted Convention on Domestic Workers on June 16, 2011. ILO and Globalization, seeking a process of globalization that is inclusive, democratically governed and provides opportunities and tangible benefits for all countries and people. The World Commission on the Social Dimension of Globalization was established by the ILO's governing body in February 2002 at the initiative of the Director General in response to the fact that there did not appear to be a space within the multilateral system that would cover adequately and comprehensively the social dimension of the various aspects of globalization. The World Commission Report, A Fair Globalization, Creating Opportunities for All is the first attempt at structured dialogue among representatives of constituencies with different interests and opinions on the social dimension of globalization, aimed at finding common ground on one of the most controversial and divisive subjects of our time. See also, Centre William Rapid, first permanent home of the ILO on the north bank of Lake Geneva, Decent Work Agenda of the ILO, United Nations Global Compact, 1999 Euro 2000, Encouraging businesses to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies, international labor organization conventions, labor movement, sole declaration on safety and health at work, 2008, social clause, the integration of seven core ILO labor rights conventions into trade agreements, globalization, international labor standards, references. Further reading, Alcock, A History of the International Labor Organization, Chisholm. A. Labour's Magna Carta, a critical study of the labor clauses of the peace treaty and of the draft conventions and recommendations of the Washington International Labor Conference, Dufty, N.F. Organizational Growth and Goal Structure, The Case of the ILO, International Organization 1972 Volume 26, 
pages 479 a euro 498 in JSTOR, Enders, A. Fleming, G. International Organizations and the Analysis of Economic Policy, 1919 a euro 1950, Evans, A. A. My Life as an International Civil Servant in the International Labour Organization, Ewing, K. Britain and the ILO, Fried, John H. E. Relations between the United Nations and the International Labour Organization, American Political Science Review, Volume 41, No. 5, PPA 963 Euro 977 in JSTOR, Galenson, Walter. The International Labour Organization, An American View, Bali, Victor Eve. The International Labour Organization are a case study on the evolution of UN specialized agencies Dordgt, Martinus Nijov Publishers, Haas, Ernst B. Beyond the Nation State, Functionalism and International Organization Colchester, ECPR Press, Heldal, H. Norway and the International Labour Organization, 1919 Euro 1939 Scandinavian Journal of History 1996 Vol. 21, pages 255 Euro 283, Imber, M.F. The USA, ILO, UNESCO and IAEA, Politicization and Withdrawal in the Specialized Agencies, Johnston, G.A. The International Labour Organization, Its Work for Social and Economic Progress, Mannering, J. International Labour Organization, A Canadian View, Morse, D. The Origin and Evolution of the ILO and Its Role in the World Community, Austria, Gary B. The American Decision to Join the International Labour Organization, Labour History, Volume 16, Issue 4 Autumn 1975, pages 495 Euro 504 The U.S. joined in 1934, Van Doel, Jasmian. The International Labour Organization in Past and Present Research, International Review of Social History 2853, 3, 485 Euro 511, Historiography, External Links, Official Site of the International Labour Organization, the International Training Center of the ILO, Nobel Peace Prize 1969 for the ILO.